joining us for webinar Wednesday. This is Expert in Action, implementing effort in any site or organization. Today's presenter is Dr. Michael, Associate Professor Director of the Program called Peru. He's an epidemiologist by training. Service for a particular area of um, risk services, especially which is solving of experts within various healthcare settings. So, for I turn over to Dr. Schultz, I can catch you. And uh, I'm going to ask some more poll questions, and I hope you. Okay, um, first poll question is, um, what current professional role do you have? Are you a counselor, a nurse, or a Are you a program or unit or a university faculty or other? If you pick us know what other is um, and add you to the uh, um, information on this, if you will type that and the question box, so we will have that recorded. Okay, thank you. I will close this poll now. We'll show the results. Okay, um, Dr. Fringle, today 29% uh, of our audience are counselors. 11% are nurses. Program percent are you faculty and thirty nine other along. Oops, sorry. Okay, this one is in the similar vein. Um, what people do you represent? Are you mental health, addiction, physical health, education, or EAP? Okay, thank you. I think we have a good representation here. I will close oh. Okay, in today's audience, we have 50% uh, mental health, 48% is 27% physical health, 9% education, and no EAP. Thank you. Um, these next two are going to be very brief. Okay, do you currently conduct expert interventions? Yes or no? Okay, thank you. I'll share. Uh, today, only 22% of the people um, listening um, actually do expert Seventy-eight. Um, do you see your agency using expert expert in the future? Um, if you use it now, yes, or um, be. Okay, thank you very much. I'll close this last poll and share it now. Um, Dr. Pringle, today 80% of the people attending the day, um, their agency to do expert now or are planning on I'm going to turn the over to Dr. 
Thank you very much. Um, I just want to make sure um, that everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, just um, did you click the, um, the, the screen so that we see your, uh, just click that sign in the middle of your screen so that we can see your PowerPoint. There we go. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, this afternoon I'm going to go through a number of slides that are going to give an overview of what you would want to consider if you were implementing SBIRT in any of your practice sites or in any of your systems if you're responsible for a system of care, which might include many practice sites. I, I need to tell you that many of the things that I'm presenting, there are worksheets, a lot of materials that are behind them, but I'm giving you an overview so that you get a general sense and you will, I believe, get some information from this presentation that you can apply directly as you go forward in implementing uh, SBIRT, which I notice many of you are interested in doing. So the first thing I'd like to, to mention is that actually the implementation of SBIRT is not something that you can use like a recipe. Um, for example, you don't want to be doing something like using toolkits, curricula, monographs, um, a list of speakers and expect that you're going to get implementation in a way that will result in people sustaining it or implementing it as planned. Um, the idea that this is something that is similar to a recipe is actually incorrect, but it's often the case in terms of how people approach this. In fact, the systems in which we work, whether it's systems that are part of your health plan or your site or your uh, where you're a provider are actually complex and by that we mean that they actually um, have moving parts and each of these moving parts move independently. So what happens in one part of your organization may not necessarily be directed by another part of your organization and having influence on one part of your organization doesn't necessarily mean that things will just naturally evolve so that your entire organization is affected. So I want to make that point really clear because this is very important to understanding implementation. We'll go over different aspects of how you can address this. It's sort of like learning to walk and chew gum at the same time. Recipe books and toolkits are helpful because we think, well, it's just a matter of learning one, two, three, four, but actually the way things work it's one, two, three, four, while simultaneously ABCD is occurring. So you have to kind of learn how to manage the multiple ways in which an organization functions and is affected in order to be successful when you implement. Okay, the, the way in which we would be able to affect a system that's complex and any system that involves humans is complex. So that means again that you by training one individual in a system doesn't mean that it will diffuse through the system. It also doesn't mean that that individual will know how to implement ESPER just by virtue of training. In fact, quite the opposite when you deal with adult learners. You need to understand the concept Instead of thinking of it in terms of only a training activity or only a process improvement activity. Okay, the, the model that we use in there's a lot of static right now. Are you hearing it? Muted. Okay. The model that we use in implementation is actually called an innovations model. It's not something, again, that involves, uh, well, we'll do training of these people and then we'll basically uh, collect this kind of data and then we'll... Uh, 
all the circles. So they are the vision and purpose, the culture, behavior, performance measurement, infrastructure design, internal learning, leadership, and external learning. And I'm going to define each of those components for you so that you understand what they mean. So you would want to planfully affect each of these in a way that would result in stable implementation. A lot of folks that can do stable implementation in some large organizations or even small ones understand these things intuitively. And they often are able to do it. And if you tease apart how they're doing it, you'll see that they understand this enough to be able to pull this all together simultaneously. Similarly, as I said, sort of walking and chewing gum. So what we've done is we've put this in explicitly so you can identify what those components are. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how you can affect each of those components so that you can get stable implementation. So where to begin? Right now, some people are very nervous because it sounds as if what we're talking about is something that seems too complex for them to be able to handle. And that's why I want to take each one of the levers, break them down, and talk about what they need to be, and you'll see that it's not that bad, that in essence you have a direction with each of the levers that you want to be able to carefully move your, your program towards so that you'll be able to implement SBIRT in a way that can be sustained um, in the future. So the most important first step is to determine what your program's vision is. Um, this seems like a stupid step. People don't understand. They think, well, you know, what is a vision? A vision is just something that you do when you go on a retreat and they tell you what's your vision and you write down a vision and that's the end of it. Nobody ever uses it again. But when you're implementing something, especially an innovation that's new within a system, a, a vision is extremely important and essential because it's a way to get everybody to co coalesce around a common purpose, the greater purpose of what it is that you're you're doing. So it needs to be declared and formally written. It is usually something that's built upon consensus, but I'll offer you an ideal vision that you may want to steal as you go forward with your work. It stretches to the ideal, which means that if you were to achieve the vision um, currently, you'd be at what we call perfection or perfect patient care. So it's something that you're always trying to stretch to attain. And you always prominently display and you use it in your correspondence, in your um, presentation, so that everybody begins to become comfortable that this is the focus, the greater purpose of what it is that we are going to do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why this greater purpose is so important um, and what it does to try to smooth the waters when it comes to implementation. So the vision, as I said, tells you when your work is done, and it also tells you when you've got a problem. If you compare what you're doing now with the vision and you see there's a gap, that gap is your problem, and then you decide, well, how am I going to address that problem? And if you keep the vision very ideal, you're always going to have problems, so you're always going to have something to work on. Um, if you don't have a vision and you don't identify your problems, your problems come up in terms of who thinks they're most important, and your vision changes based on what's going on in your organization, and who thinks the most important thing should be X in terms of Y and what your organization should do. And that can be because of changes in leadership, changes in the environment, changes in a lot of ways. And then everybody becomes confused because they're thinking, well, what is it that we really all are about? So they create their own vision. That's what people do all the time in organizations without declared visions. They create their own vision. And then they operate based on that vision. And we'll talk about why that's really problematic when you're implementing something. So it will reduce your organizational resistance because your organizational resistance comes from people having different values and beliefs. It doesn't come from people having different intelligences. It doesn't come from ignorance. It comes from different values and beliefs. We do not know what we do not first believe. So belief drives knowledge. You, le you know something because you believe in it. You want to do something because it falls within your set of beliefs and attitudes, not because suddenly you have a V8 moment and decide that this is something that you should be doing. 
Um, so a vision gets everybody similar in terms of their um, values and beliefs, which helps to reduce resistance. The ideal vision, and here's the one you can steal, is every patient receives the correct ESPER process by the appropriate staff and providers at the right time every time. So this doesn't mean 80% of them do. It doesn't mean that, you know, heck, if so-and-so's off, we'll just stick, you know, whoever can take the screening away from someone, they can do it. Um, we, we don't say, well, this doctor, we don't let him do an ESPER because he doesn't do it right. Um, we don't uh, refer people to treatment because you all know that they can't get in. It means every patient gets the right care every time by the right provider. So you have to specify what right care is, you've got to specify who the right provider is, and you've got to make sure the process encompasses every single patient. And of course that doesn't happen right off the bat, but this is the vision, this is what you're working towards. And typically a vision such as this will not create problems in terms of values and beliefs. Most people, if they get into this extremely high-paying um, uh, career in, uh, in behavioral health, and I'm being facetious, do it because they want to be able to make a difference and have some meaning in a patient's life or an individual's life. So this is a, a vision that tends to work actually throughout healthcare. So when we talk about resistance again, and a lot of you, as you think about it, implementing ESPER, can think of all the different components which may offer resistance to the implementation. Please remember that resistance is due to a lack of agreement on values and beliefs. Again, not because people are dumb, ignorant, um, whatever kind of pejorative characterization we can give to somebody in the workplace who doesn't agree to do something we want them to do. It's because they don't believe that it's something they should be doing. I've got enough to do, I don't need to be doing this. We don't need to be highlighting patients with drug and alcohol issues in our particular program. Um, what's the point of doing this? We can't get anybody into treatment anyway. I don't believe in recovery, I don't think it exists. These are some of the things that are values and beliefs that can impact why someone would or would not participate in implementing ESPER. So you want to be constantly looking at ways you can get everyone on board with values and beliefs. Knowledge is not a path to getting somebody on to values and beliefs. Um, that, that giving people all the information they need just bores them. So you want to make sure that you're using strategies that go back to why people wanted to provide meaning in the workplace. And then once you've got their values and beliefs that are similar in terms of the vision, then you can provide the knowledge that's necessary so that they can do the ESPER tasks in a way that is effective. So it's usually backwards. Um, when you go to any ESPER trainings, you notice they all start off with a lot of knowledge. And um, typically what happens is people's eyes glaze over. They're not interested. Um, or they're saying, you know, whatever I just said before, why are we doing this, blah, 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 blah. So you want to start off with ways in which you can reduce resistance by increasing some way to have agreement in values and beliefs. Once you decided to implement, you want to lay out your implementation strategy. So you want to choose the easier sites first, and we'll talk about how you determine whether a site is easy or not. You want to start small, and then you want to carefully nurture and grow your champions. Champions are essential to sustaining ESPER, and we'll talk about what champions or who champions are, ideally within an organization, but they're essential not only to sustain within one site, but also to leverage for being able to implement across sites. You want to leverage your success, and leveraging with the champions is one way. Leveraging with information about how you've been effective is another way. And you want to learn how you can improve along the way and set specific targets and timelines. All of this should be within your implementation strategy, um, and it should be addressed. We're going to talk about each of the levers in a few minutes, but it's important to consider these principles whenever you're developing your implementation strategy. So how do you evaluate your sites to choose the best ones in which to implement first? 
So we have an organizational readiness assessment. There are others that are out there, and they look at um, the different components of the innovation model, the vision, leadership, culture, behavior, experience, and commitment and support. And from that, um, determine whether a site may be at what I call a good candidate to a poor candidate for implementation. And when you start off, you want to be using your good candidates first and then moving towards your poor candidates. If you have something that's really a poor candidate, you may never get them on board. And because they will require so many resources and support that you may not have the resources and support sufficient to be able to get them to where you need them to be. So knowing that they're in the very poor category, maybe the lower 10 to 15 percent of what would be the distribution of sites, may be enough information to tell you, well, let's find another site to replace them. Because you do not want to be bouncing your head against a wall, especially if your resources are limited, as all of our resources are limited. So the triage criteria for selecting what we call an early adopter, because the early adopters are sort of in uh, looking at uh, Everett Rogers' um, diffusion of innovations um, parlance, are four out of five of these criteria. They have an intact leadership structure, not one in which you've got holes missing in the leadership, or the leadership is one that um, you know, it's not clear who reports to whom. Engaged senior leadership, which means that they've got senior leaders that are interested and understand the importance of ESPER and are willing to provide the support and authority necessary to be able to move it forward. A stable organization, you don't want one that's actually on the verge of bankruptcy or one in which they've had massive staff turnover or leadership turnover. Successful experience with innovations, that's a very important criteria and actually should be weighted more than some of the others because if they've done innovation successfully in the past, appropriate <laughs> champion, this is really important. Um, the champion must have access to senior leaders, should have the trust of the senior leaders and the authority over the implementation. I've seen states and sites give the role of a champion to someone who is the behavioral health specialist, for example. The behavioral health specialist is not somebody who has the ear of the clinic director, doesn't have any authority because essentially they're considered part of the staff but not maybe part of the central line of communication in that staff. Not all clinics are like that, but many are. And therefore, um, when there's a problem, they don't know or ha have no way of being able to get in touch with someone so that they can get that problem addressed. And therefore, as a champion, they're not terribly effective. They have interest in implementing because it fits the declared patient vision, and they buy into that declared patient vision. So, you would take these criteria that I mentioned, and we have different worksheets and things that we've developed over the years, um, including a booklet, um, and you would apply them, but you can apply those criteria I just went over. That in of itself um, gets you a good start. Um, with discussions with regional leaders, payers, state leaders, providers, et cetera, if you're looking at a systemic implementation, uh, interviews with the potential site senior middle level managers and frontline staff, and using uh, looking at data that the site or system might have, such as annual reports, purveyor, provider network reports, etc., to be able to look at things such as stability, such as organizational culture, leadership, and so forth, um, so that you begin to get a, a good sense using these criteria of where the site stands. The interviews of senior, middle, and frontline staff is really one of the most important aspects of this because it's direct evidence. And we have a, an interview that we use to sit down and interview the staff to be able to determine um, where they fall on those criteria. You can make up your own based on the triage criteria that I just went over. Um, there are some others out there.
and innovations such as Esper. So here's some, if we were to look at um, the interview that would be done on the sites that you triaged as being ones that you think are good risks or good bets to be able to implement Esper, you want to be able to look at their um, leadership because you know how they say in um, uh, real estate, it's location, location, location. Well, it's leadership, leadership, leadership is really one of the key uh, determinants of whether a site will be a good one for implementing an innovation. It needs to be stable with little turnover, vision driven. They should, the members you interview should be able to talk about the vision of their organization similarly. If it's not formally declared, they should be able to say it's similar between them. The leadership sees its role as to provide resources and tools to achieve the vision as opposed to thinking that everyone should just read their minds and be able to achieve it without their providing the resources and tools. It doesn't enter into blame. That's a key component because as you're implementing a new service, people are going to learn. They may make mistakes. You don't want leadership standing over their shoulder looking for when they make missteps. And it's always available and open for support. So those are some of the criteria for leadership. Those are others, but those are the key ones that you're interviewing these top, middle, and frontline staff. They also, um, the leadership is provided support up the chain. So let's say that you have um, leadership that's uh, of a site within a large organization. That leader can access the leader above him or her to be able to gain the support needed to be able to address issues that come up. They clearly define the work and expectations. They use consistent styles and approaches. They're transparent about problems as opposed to hide the problems. They're collaborative. And uh, the informal leadership is on the same page as the formal leadership. OK, so what, what do we mean by informal leaders? Informal leaders are extremely important to identify and understand when you're implementing at a site. An informal leader does not have a formal leadership title. They lead what is called a cell. If you were in high school, they'd be called a clique. Um, they're a group of people that sort of listen to that informal leader. The staff within the cell are affected by the opinions and direction of the informal leaders. They sort of tell them, don't listen to what the, lead, the management says, do what I say. They may or may not share the same vision as the formal leadership. And they can create great resistance to implementation if they don't share the same vision as the formal leadership. Because they're undermining everything you're trying to do. And in the essence of doing that, what they're, they're creating is a no-go. No matter what you do, you're not finding the staff are responding or they're responding in a way that's sabotaging or you're not able to get it moving forward. Um, it's extremely important to identify yourselves and your informal leaders within your organization um, because as you implement, they will create your resistance and you may not have the resources to get around that resistance for that given site. You may have to do something such as restructuring that cell or um, moving to another site because the resistance is too great. Um, when we do our interviews, we, we look for informal leaders. We look for the degree to which the staff all appear to be on the same page with the leadership with respect to what their vision of their job is. Or are they listening to other folks within the staff? And that comes out right away. Because typically, if there's an informal leader, the informal leader is very happy to explain to the staff why what the management is suggesting is stupid. And therefore, the front staff when you interview them will tell you in a very well defended way why it is that the management it doesn't think straight when it comes to certain ideas and therefore that's a key indicator that you've got some informal leaders and then you can fish those out by asking was there somebody you really listen to to do your job and they really help you understand where management is misguided and when you find that out then you really get a sense of to what extent you need to actually uh, break up that cell 
or go to another site. Um, if you've got, I've been in some not too big, not too terribly large sites in which they may have two to three informal leaders. And what happens is everything the management does gets dissipated by the informal leaders who tell the people, don't listen to the management. And then the informal leaders fight amongst themselves as well. It's not too dissimilar from a feudal system. Um, I guess people would call it Game of Thrones. <coughs> Essentially what you have is you've got um, somebody who's trying to get all these different factions and princes to all sort of be on the same page. But they each have their own kingdoms and they each want to do their own thing. And it's extremely difficult to do that. Hospitals are a prime example of where you have these cells. Each of the departments have a leadership structure and they don't sometimes listen to the management and the organization of the, of the hospital. So this is a really important point and not and something that really can't be overestimated. The criteria for the interview, we also have um, domains that look at the organizational behavior of this organization with respect to how relationships are built. Um, do they, for example, build relationships in a way that is to support the work or are they built based on hierarchy within the organization um, and are the relationships constructive or destructive? Um, how decisions are made? Are they making decisions in a way that only the people in charge can make the decisions or is it based on who's more expert? Um, is it collaborative in the decision process? The more collaborative you are, the, the better it, it will be for you to be able to implement in a way where you've thought of everything because everybody sees the organization with different eyes. When we, we do this, we actually can rate the organizations with respect to their relationships with decision-making power, conflict, and learning and get sort of a a number and that and then a sum of that number and then that'll tell you the degree on a sliding scale whether this culture is more or less going to be able to support innovation. Power, um, power is an important one because if it's coercive power it typically um, is not going to stick and therefore you may get an implementation but then as soon as you turn your back and something else comes up they're going to move on to something different in terms of implementing SBIRT. So again, there's a, a measure of looking at how power is used. Is it used um, across the board, everyone sort of shares, or is it used only by those that have the titles? Um, and in some cases, the informal leaders. Conflict. Conflict is not a bad thing if it's used to try to figure out what's the best way to do something, and it's not personalized, and it's not destructive. But if conflict is avoided at all costs, or if it's destructive, it is a bad thing. So you kind of want to know how are you, do you use conflict within your organization. And learning. The degree to which the organization values and makes it part of its process how to learn to improve. You can say, and we call it the lip service, that you value learning, but when you find out is when an organization learns something, rather than taking the processes and changing it so that it's now reflected in how you do business differently, they just say, well, we learned something and then do nothing about it. Well, we learned something and they say to three or four of the staff, well, you, we've learned something, so now would you please go forward and try to make sure that, that uh, you've used this learning without making it a systematic change in the process. And when those three to four people leave, a year later, somebody's learning the same thing over again. Nothing is more demoralizing in an organization. And the organization is treading water all the time and isn't really moving forward. So having these criteria for organizational behavior and assessing them on the scale of where they are is really helpful in being able to determine what would be the likelihood that this organization could take up SBIRT and be able to implement it. So you want to pick organizations that score better rather than worse to be the ones that you do your first implementation efforts on. And again, it, can, it may be one aspect of your, your organization rather than the whole organization, but make it be as small as it is practical for you to demonstrate um, 
that you, A, understand what the unit is, and B, that you can implement SBIRT effectively. Here's some additional criteria that we use in our interviews. Um, we look at their performance measurement system. Do they have an effective system and do they use it? And I'll talk a little bit later about what constitutes an effective performance measurement system. But the most important thing is, do they use it? Because it's usually not effective if they don't use it. So you can use that as a, as a general sort of litmus test. If they're using their performance measurement system in the course of their work and correcting their work accordingly, it's probably an effective performance measurement system. Do they have an internal learning system? Do they have a, a process that they use to systematically learn how they can improve what they do? And those are typically called Six Sigma, Lean, there's a number of different names for them. Um, and it used to be that people thought all you needed was Lean to, to drive or support implementation and innovation. And what happened is they used it in organizations in which they had really good organizational culture and leadership. And they got positive results and said, look, it was the Toyota system, or look, it was Lean, or Six Sigma. No, it was not. It was that you applied it within an organization that had really good leadership and really good culture. And those organizations tended to be the ones that said, sure, I'll try it. You know, I really want to improve what I'm doing. And so there was confounded. And the, the lean in of itself did not drive change um, of the entire organization. So it's just one lever of all the levers you need. The external learning system is that they have an effective just-in-time staff development plan. Um, a lot of times training plans are what I call spaghetti on the wall. It's kind of, we'll just throw all this information at you and maybe some of it will stick. Um, it should be information that has been assessed that the staff needs in order to improve what they're doing or to learn how to implement ESPER. It should not be, um, let's just sit down and train you on all aspects of ESPER and then you'll just pick out yourself what aspects you think are important. Or let's now sit down and give you ongoing staff development regarding ways to support ESPERT implementation. And you have to sit through two hours of this, even though you don't do this part of the ESPERT um, component. Rather than giving those people that don't do the actual components, such as, let's say, referral to treatment, and giving them an awareness training, we make everybody sit through the agony of the entire training, and they don't necessarily all need it. So um, figuring out what your staff needs when they need it and making sure that you give them what they need, a just-in-time staff development plan, is really important. And then mapping and documenting that each of your staff got what they needed is, an, is another component of that. <clears throat> your organizational structure is also important. Um, you want to make sure that the right people are doing the process that they need to do to make sure you meet your vision. You may have to change some of the structure. You may have to have a triage nurse doing something that typically she didn't do. Or you may have to have a physician or resident do something that they don't typically do in the process. But you want to make sure that the structure you pick is going to meet the needs of your visions and that you have thought it through. Sometimes that structure may involve an electronic health record. Sometimes that may involve uh, relationships with substance use disorder treatment components. Whatever it takes, you have to change the structure so that the patient gets the right care. For example, with the referral to treatment, making a passive referral such as Oh, by the way, here's your, the name of your drug and alcohol treatment facility that we think you should go to, and uh, give them a call when you get a chance. What percentage of people go under those conditions? Probably well below 30%, close to 20 or 15. Um, if instead you decide the structure should be that you refer them to a case manager who calls them right away, says, what can I do to get you into that treatment? Can I accompany you? whatever, whatever um, you know, the circumstances. And then should I tell the program that you've arrived so that they know that for the referrals that they have made, 
that they actually bore fruit as opposed to just sort of into the, the, the air, into the vapor. Um, this is particularly the case if you're implementing in a general medical setting. Um, if you can get information back to that setting that X percent of people got into treatment, um, they are very much and more able to sustain expert than if they think, or at least sustain the referral to treatment component. Otherwise, they think that um, it's just it's just a waste of their time. Nobody gets there anyway. So that's an example of how you change the structure of this so that you can make sure people get the right care. The other aspect is looking at making sure that everything you do is evidence-based. I'm a stickler with this to the point, though, that not to the point that you get into analysis paralysis and you can't move forward, because there is dueling evidence when it comes to SBIRT. Um, everybody sort of covets their little corner of the SBIRT uh, literature and says this is the true oracle of SBIRT, and that's just not true. Um, there, there isn't a true oracle of SBIRT. Essentially what there is is there's literature that you need to evaluate as to what's appropriate or not appropriate and use your best educated guess. If you are applying an SBIRT practice, um, like a brief negotiated interview, in a setting where it's never been in, implemented before or there is no evidence to support it, just declare it. Say, I know there's no evidence for a BNI in this setting, but we've chosen the BNI for the following reasons. As opposed to just ignoring that and then having people who know that that's never been demonstrated before prove that or say that your model is entirely non-evidence-based. So I think it's important to understand the evidence, understand its limitations, and then make your best guess decision as to where you want to go. Um, as long as you're informed and as long as you have decided based on that information how to make your best guess decision, there's nothing wrong with that. So you want to select your sites based on your own and their potential resources. So you map your resources to the ability of that site based on your assessment to implement SBIRT. And then you decide, okay, here's a site where they don't require great resources and they're a pretty good bet for implementation. Do you want to start off with those sites? If you don't want to start off with, well, this site's closer to me and I happen to know the, you know, one of the middle managers, they're a friend of mine, so we'll go there. Or um, the, the people that are helping to pay for us to implement SBIRT or are trying to push us to implement in this site, and based on the assessment, I know this would be a terrible site to implement, and I don't have the resources to do it. That's a prescription for disaster, and you want to resist that at all costs. You want to go into this informed and planful, knowing that the site is one that has a reasonable opportunity for implementing SBIRT, and you have the resources that are needed. And remember what I said before about the the fact that um, you need to be careful when you're looking at these intern, informal leaders or cells. You can have um, many of the aspects of that organization be, you know, decent, but if you've got a lot of informal leaders and cells, typically it means your leadership overall is not strong. And second, it's going to require a tremendous amount of resources to get through those cells. So keep that in mind as you're assessing where are your best sites are. So you can rank your sites by their implementation potential scores after you've done the assessment. High potential sites, they, um, there's reduced assistance needed and reduced resources. Um, low potential, they need increased assistance and, and resources. So you want to make sure that you are gaining the momentum with your high potential sites first before you move to your low potential sites. If you fail at a low potential site and you've got six high potential sites behind you to your credit, your whole expert initiative is still likely to move forward. But if you start at a low potential site and fail, you may find your whole expert initiative has been derailed and you're not going to be able to move forward anywhere. So this is so key and so important that it really bears emphasis in terms of your consideration. Once you've decided to rank them, then kind of look at what kind of resource allocation you're going to need. Let's say you're going to implement over a two-year period. 
and you know that in your first year you can sort of rank by resources sites one, two, and three and say that that's enough for me to do in the first year. Then you can rank uh, four, five, and six um, for the next year knowing that they should hopefully have require equal resources. So you don't want to have all low, 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 high, high, high. You may want to mix a, a moderate in with those lows and move a low over into your second year so that you can still maintain your momentum. That may be essential for your, your particular system or your organization, or it may not be. But a lot of this you'll gain experience and you'll sort of know how to manage that as you move forward. So the first step is you want to conduct what's called a current condition or a business process analysis. And by that, you want to go and observe the work. And in observing the work, you want to specify who's doing the work, what's being done, where it's being done, and when it's being done. And you can do this by having people, depending on the size of the site you're observing, standing at various parts of the site. Let's say you're doing the emergency department. Someone standing in the triage section, somebody standing where the patients are seen, somebody standing where the discharge, all gives you a sense of how a patient goes through that emergency department. And you want to list for each of those components what's happening in the who, what, where, when. And in the when, you also want to be able to time it, give a clock time for each of the components. There's another process called an A3 where you actually draw these out in a picture. A3 is the size of the paper. This is used in Lean or Toyota. Um, and it's a perfectly fine process, but you don't have to know how to do an A3 to do this. You can use an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, and you can actually do a narrative with the times and the, uh, the flows described, though a picture is usually a preferred method with the narrative, not just the narrative alone. And essentially what this does is it gives you a sense of where are there times where this patient may have downtime, where are there times where this patient may actually um, have uh, um, some opportunity to be able to have an intervention, for example, or where do the staff have that opportunity, and where could we maybe change things around to make it more efficient so there's more time to be able to do the expert activities. You really should never implement SBIRT unless you've done this step. And at the end, you'll develop tentative or hypothesized places where they can actually implement in the work site based on your observation. You'll always compare what's going on to the vision. Is every patient getting the right care by the right provider every time? And you want to identify where there are major problems. For example, um, the way this, this ED is set up, if they get um, more than 20 patients reporting in a given hour, they just forget to do the screen altogether. Everybody goes offline because it just becomes too difficult for us to do the screen. So we just decide that we're just not going to do it at all. That's not good. And that's a problem because every, every patient then is not getting the right care at the right time. Step two is then once you've done this analysis of the workplace, is you actually um, determine the project vision and goals and specify the work. So um, the, if your project vision and goals are, as I said before, to be able to make sure every patient gets the right care at the right time, you can then look at the workflow and compare it against those, that vision and goal. Um, and you also want to make sure that you specify everybody's work um, in terms of what they're supposed to do. So um, this helps you determine what the very specific process should be for the implementation of ESPR in that work site. I'd say about half to 60% of the problems with implementation come from not specifying the work appropriately. And that means that it's not really clear who's doing what, when, why, and how. Um, and what happens in the absence of that is people sort of make it up, and then they give it up. Because they figure, well, you know what, if it was that important, they would have specified it. And so then they have other things sort of stand in the way. Well, we were doing expert, 
Monday and Tuesday of this week. We stopped doing it on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday because we got too busy. But if the work is specified and it's embedded in the HR, which is a really important thing to do, or embedded in the whole work process, uh, and there's a way in which that process can't go forward unless the escrow process is part of it, it's not going to get thrown out on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. People are just going to make it just part of the normal course of how they do their work. And it'll move forward and it'll be sustained. So here are the four rules of use. These come from Toyota. And I did say um, that Toyota is not what guides innovation uh, models, but it is an internal learning process. So it's a process of how you can set up what you do so that it's, uh, you can learn as quickly as possible ways to improve it. So all work must be spe highly specified as to the content, sequence, timing, location, and expected outcome. You need to show who's going to do the screening, when they do the screening, what happens after they do the screening, how the patient screen moves through the system. Every customer supplier, which would be provider, patient, connection, must be simple and direct. There must be a binary yes or no and a way to send requests and receive responses. So in other words, you don't have, well, when you're done with the screens, um, you know, somehow get the results over to the physician. Um, or say to somebody, let me know what happens with the referral to that person. Well, you know, if they forget about doing it, they're not going to let you know. And the problem was not so much them, but you didn't specify. I need to know tomorrow, can you tell me the following ways, what happened to the referral of that patient? Or the screen will go and be in the, the chart in, on a purple paper that will be clipped to the patient's chart that sits in the envelope in, in the front of the door. Or the patient's screen will be in the EHR, and it will actually, the results have to be used to determine a treatment plan. So therefore, when the physician or the nurse sees the patient, they can't just ignore it and decide, well, we're just not going to include this in our treatment plan. It's actually ingrained into the process of how the treatment plan is developed. The pathway for every product and service must be predefined, simple and direct, with no loops or forks. Um, so uh, a potential fork is um, if the patient says that they um, yes to the screening, um, then they can go in one of two directions depending on how busy things are. Well, that's a bad thing because what happens is you don't know whether they went in one or two, direct, two directions and you don't know the results of what happened when they did. So loops and forks are really bad things. They create inefficiency and often what happens is they create apathy in the staff and they decide on their own based on their own values and beliefs when they should cut that process out altogether. And they feel they're justified because A, it wasn't specified it wasn't good enough that you needed to specify when it needs to be done. And B, nobody has really told them how it relates to the vision and why it's important that they do it the same way every time they talk to a patient. Any improvement must be made using the scientific method under the guidance of a teacher, close in time, space, and person to the problem and towards the ideal. So whenever you find that there are problems, that every patient isn't getting the expert services, um, then you want to make sure that you right away identify that as a problem and then have a way, typically using your champion, to be able to identify um, how it is you can address that problem so that you can move closer to the idea. Not two weeks from now, not based on data that you gather and look at three months from now, but, but fairly close in time to when the problem occurred so that you can change the process and you can then be able to ensure that um, the problem is removed. Remember I told you that I was going to go over what were the components of a performance measurement system that are ideal. And first of all, they should be as simple as possible. Um, you don't want a performance measurement system that has 16 components gathered on th four or five times during the day and that you, somebody needs to put their key into the computer and twist it so that you can access another component of the 
EHR so that you will be able to enter one other level of the data. You want something to be simple so that it's a matter of yes, no, entering it um, very quickly and it doesn't impede how they do their work. So it's collected in the course of doing their work. If you tell people, I don't know any, if any of you are SAMHSA grantees, but there is GIPRA. But if, they're, if you're not using GIPRA, you want something that when you collect the data, it's collected in the course of doing their work, not something that, you know, well, we've collected this data, now we're going to hire so-and-so's niece to sit here in meetings and weekends and enter it into the computer. No, it should be something that's entered as you do your work and gathered as you do your work should be meaningful. Staff are extremely good at telling you that a particular performance measurement is not meaningful at all. And therefore, um, they're not going to do it. It should be transparent. It's something that um, you share the results amongst yourselves and talk about them, as opposed to only the leaders get to see the results, and then they can use that, that information to bludgeon the staff and say, you're doing it wrong. You want something where you can collaboratively look at it and find ways to improve. It aids learning. So it's something that tells you, ah, oh, so if we do it this way, more patients will get the intervention. If we do it this way, we're more apt to reach a patient that has the following concerns. And this is something that we're going to now make sure happens all the time with that type of patient. It's reported in real time. So it's reported as close to when it, the data are collected as possible. Otherwise, if you wait too long from when the data is collected, you don't really know what caused that problem. You've forgotten it. And therefore, you make these judgments as to how to change the process, and those judgments are wrong. And when you change the process, you don't get any difference when it was with respect to how the problem um, is occurring in your system. And it's used to guide improvements. If, if a system is used to guide improvements, it is definitely something that is going to uh, be meaningful. It's going to be probably more simple and collected in the course of doing this work. Um, people don't use performance measurements that are too difficult for them. They just don't and are not meaningful. They, they ignore them. You also want to look at um, developing a staff development or training plan. And initially what we do is we do something that's light on theory or knowledge and heavy on skill. Um, we let the patient sell expert as opposed to all that knowledge that's in all those references. Um, people really don't care, to be honest with you all the knowledge and literature, they really are more important. And it's more important to them to say, does this really impact patient care? Do patients like it? Do patients respond to it? Am I being part of a process of improving care rather than a process in which care is, is um, made less, less good, is, is not improved? We also look at proficiency and make sure that proficiency um, is mapped to skills so that we are, we are sure every person who is trained um, in a specific level of skill um, that we have demonstrated their proficiency using a proficiency checklist, for example. And SAMHSA is about to, um, I think, at least uh, publish or bring forward a proficiency checklist that was developed by several of the med res grantees that you can use to assess the general area of expert skill acquisition that it also involves embedded champions who are provided ongoing technical assistance. The champions can do your training once you've got a good champion, but you may need to have technical assistance provided to them on an ongoing basis by someone outside your organization or in, depending on how far you've developed a system to support expert. And it also uses adult learning principles, which means people don't want to know what they don't think they need to know. So if, you, if you're telling them something they don't think they need to know, you might as well save your breath. In addition, that it's provided in a way that enhances their engagement and their interest in learning. And that it takes into account that skills decay over time. Those are all um, very important adult learning principles. 
Another aspect of this is you, you don't have to give everybody the, the good old vanilla ESPER training. You want to give the training um, and skill development for those that are going to do ESPER. But you may and do need an awareness or a communication plan so that you're making sure that your senior managers are aware of the importance of this by A, giving you the permission to move forward, and B, by continuing to give you that permission and support. And you want to be able to do this in a way that's very planful by giving them information that fits a need they have, and also by making sure that, um, that, that as your results are gathered, that you're giving them the information that this is making a difference. You may also want to do that to your payers or your community stakeholders who are all potentially going to be involved in sustaining the initiative over time. And you use the program evaluation data when available to be able to talk to these stakeholders and increase their awareness and understanding of the importance of ESPER. Make sure that anything you do addresses the needs and concerns of your intended audience. Do not decide that you are going to give them nitty-gritty knowledge related to ESPER and that they're going to be so enamored with this knowledge that they're going to support ESPER. They're only interested in the information about ESPER that they find interesting or important. For example, it's been uh, indicated to reduce 30-day readmissions. Um, that it has also been demonstrated to reduce alcohol and drug use even several years after the intervention has occurred. Those kinds of things. Or it saves Medicaid so many dollars per dollar spent. Always start small. Don't take on more or a massive site first. Um, pace yourself. Uh, make sure that you're thoroughly got the site engaged, trained, implementation plan, ready to, to move forward, and that you've got a plan for how it will be sustained using your champion before you hop off and provide all your focus on another site. You can do some sites simultaneously, but you have to make sure that you're planning those simultaneous activities so that they don't preclude one another, either with time, resources, or other, other things. You want to leverage your champions. As you develop the champions, make sure that you are having them help you then influence champions in other sites. And you just use this leapfrog approach to build a cadre of sort of uh, enlightened, engaged individuals that can influence other individuals to move ESPER forward. And then you also want to be able to learn, change, and improve. Otherwise, what will happen is as the inevitable turnover occurs within your staff, you'll find that people stop with the institutional memory about how they're supposed to do it or why they're supposed to do ESPER. You want to analyze your data often, use small rapid cycle learning um, to be able to determine if different changes in the practice were going to result in different and anticipated changes in the process or outcomes. You want to be able to review your work and interventions and determine that they follow um, the root cause or the uh, evidence base and that there's a return in, on investment process uh, associated with it. You want to empower your site to be part and lead the learning. If you're leading the learning, the site will not learn to fish. And essentially, this will be your expert, and they just were uh, participated. They were kind enough to participate with you. But it's not really their cup of tea. So you want to engage and empower them to be able to present the information and take the responsibility and recognition for the work they've done. If you see any changes in values that could affect your vision, nip them in the bud. Get them out in the open, talk about why the values may have changed, find a way to get back to the original value. Those, th those can take on a life of their own. They can develop legs, and the next thing you know, you've got an organizational culture that doesn't share the values it shared, when you began to implement ESPER, and it just takes ESPER to a grinding halt. Embed your learnings to make sure they're permanent. 
rather than just something that lasts for a couple of weeks till everyone forgets what the learning was because nobody embedded it in the process. And then carefully spread. Don't just decide when you've got a couple of successful sites that they alone are going to convince people to just move forward. Um, and you can cut the steps in the process because of it. You cannot cut any of these steps. You may, some may be shorter than others, but they still are absolutely necessary to good implementation. You may also, we like to do run charts, which tells you, um, for example, let's say percentage of people that um, have uh, been screened based on um, whether you were implementing a strategy partially, fully, or um, only, uh, or none at all. And essentially, doing a run chart like this, you would see that if you were implementing a specific process fully, it greatly increased the number or percentage of patients that were screened. You wouldn't have known that unless you plotted these out in terms of a run chart. And there are a myriad of reasons why you would use a run chart. Um, but it's important when you can measure things with a run chart over time that you do. So let's talk about sustainability. Sustainability is also extremely important um, in, to, in being addressed and being addressed plantfully and very, um, in a very formal way. You want to use servant leadership principles, which means that you want to make sure that um, you are supporting the staff or the program in a way to help them sustain it, as opposed to, I told you to do that, why didn't you do it? You allow the sites to present their own data, I mentioned that before, so that they're beginning to take ownership and responsibility. You only evaluate what the sites want to learn. Um, and don't force down their throats things that you think are interesting that they don't. You collaborate in the learning. Don't tell the sites what they should know or learn from the data or information that are, that are gathered. And you encourage leaders in the successful sites to influence leaders in the new or unsuccessful sites because they can typically influence the process better than if it were somebody from the outside telling the unsuccessful sites why they're unsuccessful. And you should have a plan to make yourself expendable. If you're guiding the implementation of ESPER, you should not make this be your full-time career till you retire and job security. This should be something where you can flip from one site to another, can pollinate them, and essentially move on and not make it all about you. It really should be all about the site and giving them the tools they need to be able to implement. It's really, really important that you build the case for sustainability as early as possible. Um, and you determine what are the drivers that would sustain this and what are the detractors? Drivers are circumstances typically in the environment or in the organization that we know would support sustaining ESPER. What are the detractors? Detractors are circumstances, characteristics that make sustaining ESPER difficult. Then you develop a plan to enhance or reduce the influence of each, depending on which one you're talking about. And then you continuously measure the success of your plan against its influence on the drivers and detractors. The most important thing about this whole process is to make sure that it's not something that's so arduous that people dread doing it, that you actually celebrate when a patient gets into treatment or when they actually agree to reduce their usage. Um, you celebrate all of your victories and you decide that with your um, challenges that you're even more determined. Um, you take the time to really observe when you've made progress as opposed to just saying, well, you know we've been doing this for six months now and it seems to work. Well, show the evidence that it works and celebrate it when it seems that it has worked successfully. Um, these are things that are really important to supporting morale 
when you're talking about implementing um, in, a, in sites, especially in healthcare, which under, is under tremendous duress um, because of the changes in the healthcare arena as well as many of the other stressors that healthcare is, is experiencing right now as it goes forward and tries to adapt to the changing landscape. So all of these uh, strategies are really important um, to implementing ESPER. Um, I kind of went over them in a way that is kind of a 30,000 foot view. As I said, um, we've developed worksheets and different ways to sort of apply some of these strategies and keep them all together, almost like you have an electronic health record for an organization, um, which helps you understand um, that organization and its uh, liabilities and its assets, just like you would a patient or an individual that's part of the system. Um, and we then use that as a way to guide and continue to move forward. Um, I can tell you that if you get these things in place, when you have blips in the radar, when you have turnover in leadership, or maybe um, the, the organization has decided that you know, they're under financial duress and they have to cut back some of the support services that were used, you can more easily move forward rather than so cripple yourself that you find that you have to just abandon the whole expert initiative and move on. So it's, it's, they definitely work. We've used them in multiple settings, and we've used them with um, many aspects of ESPER, not just the ones that you're familiar with, but some even adaptations of it as well. So that's, that's it for me. Um, um, so I guess at this point, um, they'll all start collecting the questions if I had to see if I have any questions, and I've left about 15 minutes for response to questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Pringle. This was a really informative um, webinar, so we appreciate you putting it together for us. Um, I do have two questions so far, and I hope that other people will um, submit questions, too, because I'm sure there are plenty around. Um, the first one is, um, can you rate on a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being the least important and 10 being the most important, the importance of having leadership buy-in. Well, um, if we're talking about um, senior leadership, um, and you're you're talking about, let's say, uh, senior leadership of a hospital, um, and you're wanting to implement Esper in every aspect of that hospital, then it's you know it's a ten. Um, if you're talking about leadership in that an emergency department within that hospital, um, then it's a 10. But if you're thinking you're only going to implement in that emergency department, um, then it's a 10 within that emergency department. And um, it could be um, an 8 or a 9 with respect to the leadership in the hospital, because you basically just want them to stay out of your way. And in those cases where you have a focus in a very small part of an organization, and we have what are called islands of excellence, which are components of the organization that are doing really well with particular innovations such as ESPER. Um, if you're not intending to spread it across the organization, you don't, at, don't have to have the same level of buy-in that you do if you are intending to spread it across the organization. Um, Certainly, you have to have it within that, that organizational unit, that smaller organizational unit. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, thanks. Um, here's another uh, question. If you were implementing ESPERT in a school rather than an emergency room or a medical office, would it change anything you have said? Nope. <laughs> um, no, it wouldn't. Um, the, the only thing is the work you're observing is uh, um, different. So you still want to do the observation. You still want to have a vision. You still want to make sure you're assessing the leadership. Um, you still want to make sure that you understand who um, are your informal leaders. You still want to do your awareness um, training. You still want to do the training based on the way that I mentioned. And you still want to measure performance over time. So none of the levers are different. It's just a matter of the context is different 
Um, and we've implemented SBIRT in, um, I haven't done, done it in a school, but I've implemented it in very different sites, some of which are non-healthcare related. It's the same in the same principles. It's just these are kind of human organizational principles, so um, they they apply regardless of where the humans are working. Okay, um, let's see here. Okay, uh, what indicators would you suggest collecting for evaluation purposes with the intent to spread expert to other departments beyond the ED? Um, well. You, you want to make sure that, A, you demonstrate that the process worked as intended so that you were screening large numbers of individuals and providing brief interventions to a proportionate number as you would anticipate in the literature, and also that you were connecting individuals to treatment. When you're dealing with the implementation of SBIRT in a general medical setting, it's extremely important that you demonstrate that you've connected these people to treatment, even though that's not the primary intention of SBIRT primary intention is actually to reduce population risk, um, of which those with substance use disorders are, tend to be a uh, pretty significant minority. But it's just the way that those who are uninitiated look at SBIRT and they want to know that people are getting into treatment. So make sure the process is working and you can demonstrate that through your evaluation. And then also, um, if you can um, get some form of outcomes such as um, even patient anecdotal responses, um, you know, having those that are, that are doing the work, such as nurses or whatever, or um, uh, other staff saying, you know, this was a good thing, the patient seemed to like it, I really enjoyed working with the patients, um, all the way up to, you know, more sophisticated analysis, such as reduction in, in alcohol and drug use from your GIFRA analyses, or even from other linkages of databases. And then finally, if you can demonstrate that you, you increased revenue um, through your billing, all of those things together sort of um, will um, influence people in other parts of the hospital. So one, you're saying, you know, if we do this, we're going to do it right. Two, you're saying, and the people that are doing it don't think it's so bad and I'll leave it to the patients. And three, guess what? You can make money off of it too. Um, that tends to influence people. Okay. Uh, do you have a follow-up questionnaire for patients to complete post-discharge that you would be willing to share? Um, we actually did develop one recently, and uh, I will ask the organization that we developed it for if they would have a problem with us sharing it, and I'll write that down, and I will um, I'll correspond with Christine on that. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, because I can certainly forward it on to um, all the attendees here. Uh, the next question is, are there any expert models that use incentives for implementation and sustainability? Um, yes. I just heard about one last week. There is a Medicaid managed care company that is going to um, roll in Esper into um, its quality improvement. So if you are a primary care practice that decides to do the Esper uh, program, you get a way in which you can demonstrate that you're entering into some of what they consider to be their recognized quality improvement strategies and therefore you are entitled not just with SBIRT but with the fact that you it's one of many things that you're doing for quality improvement if you're entitled to incentives as a practice. In addition they are activating the codes for the use of SBIRT and IMPACT which is the depression screening and that provides revenue if you decide that you're going to implement um, and implement as, as planned. Um, in terms of uh, providing direct strategies for implementation, um, I've not seen anything that says, you know, if you get so many percent screens, so many brief interventions, you get uh, 
an incentive of some kind that I've seen used organizationally or by a payer. Um, and I, if your organization is one that actually is open to that type of incentive, um, I think, or you're a payer that, that uses those kinds of incentives, then I don't see why it couldn't be used. You want to, though, make sure that you do not disentangle the incentive from the vision or greater purpose. Because what happens and if you do that is your incentive becomes the focus, not the greater purpose, and then people work towards the incentive, and sometimes they start gaming it. You know, suddenly they report more screens that happen because they sort of blur the boundaries of what the screens really are, and things like that. And, and so that's why you have to use incentives thoughtfully and sparingly. Um, Edward Deming, who created a lot of what we call the Toyota production system, he was absolutely against incentives because he said what it does is it takes away um, the greater purpose from your work. And he was talking about that not necessarily in healthcare, but even in non-healthcare related things. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, well, I think we've come just about to the end of the webinar time, and we have come to the end of the questions. So at this point, um, we can um, fold up the webinar, and it will be put on our webinar library later today, and I will be sending all the attendees the links to that, as well as the links to your PowerPoints, so they'll be able to review the webinar then. And there shouldn't be any audio problems in the final version, so I apologize for my earlier um, audio problems that we had. So thank you all very much. In about an hour, you will receive an email from GoToWebinar that will have an evaluation to it. I really hope that you will all participate in that evaluation. It uh, is very important for us to sustain all these webinars and bring them to you. So thank you again. We will be in touch. Thank you very much, Dr. Pringle. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Bye.